This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is brought to you by Squarespace. Do you have big plans for this new year? Well, Squarespace makes it easy to turn your idea into a unique website. Showcase your work, blog, or publish content, and even sell products and services of all kinds with just a few clicks. You can customize everything from a look and feel to settings and products using beautiful templates created by world-class designers. And there's nothing to install Ever. No patching, no upgrades. It just happens automatically and you just sign on and it works. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when, when you're ready to launch, use the offer code TEST, just four characters, TST, to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 4th, 2018, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Happy New Year, everyone, not only out there, but to those in here as well. How are you guys doing, Jeremy Williams? I'm well, Norman Chan. Happy and New Year to you. Happy New Year, and Kishore Hari. Hello. Jeremy, you sound like yourself. First well, time in a long time. Was I as sick as late as two weeks ago? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't been here for a while. Yeah. You haven't. I lost long. my voice like right before the podcast. La- uh, a couple weeks ago, but Danica filled in admirably. Absolutely, kept uh, you guys in place. Ooh, and and uh, shut that down. You 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 you're, you were rendered speechless by the Last Jedi. I I decided that if you don't have <laughs> something good to say, maybe you should keep it to yourself. <gasps> wow. My brother, my Whoa. man. Whoa, I, Whoa. hater cast. <laughs> I'm not as, as far along on the spectrum as uh, as Jeremy. I wa- I did go see it a couple times. It do- it got better. I didn't dislike. It did get better every time. I didn't dislike what it was trying to do, which was reset the entire Star Wars universe to be open to new ideas. I just felt like it was really long. I thought it was maybe forty-five minutes too long for what it was trying to under accomplish. Two hour, you wanted an under two-hour movie. It's not that I wanted an under two-hour movie. It was that the movie I saw was filled mm. with a lot of stuff that didn't add much to it. Primarily being what happened at the casino, I feel like didn't add anything to the story. <sighs> Wow. I feel like a lot of it was to, there were elements in the movie that were meant to tie into other parts of the properties, like whether mm-hmm. it's cartoons or comics. Was the, it? The whole Phasma thing, it turns out that links into a four series comic book that came out. And of course, I don't know anything about Would that. Would you rather not have had Phasma? She was barely in the film. But they overdid it. Like the part that she was in it was just overdone. It was mm. too dramatic he's, for he's, its own work. You're saying underdeveloped. Yeah, it, it just it the movie the movie its presence. the movie itself and including even episode seven did not deserve that whole phasma sequence. But it be, because of the uh, the whole license and all of the other properties, but she was created as go. for the films, not at not as a comic book character. I, yeah. yeah, though it is kind of cool to actually have armor that works, functional armor for once. Yeah, not a bad thing. It must be expensive because she's the only one that gets it. Yeah, chrome is very expensive, only for spaceships, and. And leaders of um of, of stormtroopers, yeah. Well, let's not talk about Last Jedi. That's in your past. Did you guys? Uh, how did you guys enjoy your break? Do you, do you do anything anything fun? Christmas? How'd you celebrate Christmas, family? My folks came out here. Actually, my parents are still around. They're around for a few more days. But I had an excellent time. Christmas in San Francisco, underrated Christmas town. Lots to do. We went ice skating. Nobody with the, here. Everybody yeah, leaves. Yeah, everybody leaves. Yeah. The rapture is fantastic. Oh, so great. You uh, go to yeah. a supermarket and like everyone's, I mean, like, props to the people who are still working over Christmas break, but it's like half empty. My, my folks were in town as well. And we got up, you know, to go driving around at 8, 9 a.m. on a weekday. And we had the roads to ourselves. Uh, wow. It was crazy. Yeah. I mean, the only places that were crowded were like, not even like shopping mall kind of places. They were like parks. So what did you guys do? Just drive around the city, go shopping, eat some food. All of the above. But I went, my favorite thing we did, ice skating at the Embarcadero with my son. That's a tradition. S- skating outside, nothing beats it. And the fact that we could do it and it was like 50 out instead of what it was like this week on the East Coast, 10 degrees, heaven. And this, it's this just a beautiful like 30 scene. rock. This is just like, it's a small skating rink. 
Uh, you know, it's a decent size rink for an outdoor rink. Like, you know, that that one at Rockefeller Center is not as big as you think it is. On, on TV, it looks so big. It's not that oh. big. And uh, so it's pretty close to the same size as that one. The one in Union Square is tiny. But um, the one in Barkindale was great. And we went, like, near sunset. And so the, the you have the view of downtown and the view nice. of Ferry Building. Bay Bridge right there. It was it was gorgeous. It was one of my favorite things. Recharge our batteries, take the week off, and well, Jeremy, we had a, a, a very special uh holiday treat. That's right. We got to go on a test ride and drive in a Tesla Model Three. Mm-hmm. Just a few days ago. Yeah. Still very fresh in our minds. Wait, f- wait, who drove? We well, both, we both, we, did. Uh, the three of us. We drove. Jeremy or, drove, or the, I drove, and, and the, the car, and the itself. car drove, and the car drove. So That's a, what I want to hear. They about. ship. They're shipping the cars right now, and someone who got their cars shipped to them. Um, we got in touch with them and 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 took it, uh, took the car up and down uh, 280, which is our freeway here along uh, south of San Francisco, to a supercharger station. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know what do you want to say about the drive. Was your was your, was your, was your first time? In a Tesla period. In a Tesla, wow. Yeah. Now, you, okay. you've you ridden a Model S. Uh-huh. I've driven a Model S and an X. And an X. Test drives, like not, not right. you know, owned <laughs> for any or driven for any. So this was my first Tesla experience and my first autopilot experience. Mm. And I, the, starting with autopilot, that is, it. I, I don't think anybody has an experience in autopilot that isn't completely nerve-wracking. When the first time they get behind the wheel and they use it. Uh, so you're not just talking about the passenger seat. You're talking about when you're, you're, you're no. turning it on, when you're... Whether you're on the freeway in the passenger seat, it's kind of like watching TV, where it's like, "That's cool. Look at what that's doing." But when you're responsible for everybody's lives, yeah, and you turn on autopilot and you're hitting that, that you're coming up to that bend on the highway, and there's yep. cars in every lane. That's when your your hands are very close to that wheel, and you're thinking, "Well, your hands should be close." This to the wheel. is nerve wracking. <laughs> it should always be on. It the should wheel. always be on the wheel. Well, uh, it is. It is definitely futuristic. Like this. This car is from the future. That is my one sentence description. And you, you're really familiar with electric cars. You've had the Bolt now for yeah. about a year, right? Exactly a year. And was, is there anything that was uh, Uncanny Valley going from the Bolt to this? I don't know what you mean by that. I, I mean by that, I mean like, was there any, I mean, it's a fully electric car. So was it, even though you describe it as a car from the future, it's really not that dramatically different beyond autopilot from what you're in now. No, it is. It is because of the u- the user experience of it, the user mm. interface. Like there is, as people who follow this car know, there are no controls. There's no dashboard. There's no display. There's no tactile controls except for this one gigantic screen that's in the center of the of the dash. And when we learn that screen, the Teslas have all had head screens. The Model S famously had that right. portrait orientation. I believe a 17 inch screen. Uh, this screen looks like it, it's on a stand propped away from the car yeah it's, and it's, you don't control the air conditioning flow you don't open the glove box with fi- physical controls with physical controls you don't open the hood with a physical control it's all done through this screen a- absolutely everything i can't tell if you're saying that in a positive way because or it's from negative. the future and i think it's it's too early for its own good because i think if, as somebody who wants who is driving the car you want accessible controls so that you don't have to look at that screen while you're doing things. So it's designed for a driver in the future where you don't necessarily have to be, have all exactly. hands on wheels at all times. Fully and, autonomous, which is yeah. to say not just highway, everything. Yeah. Take yeah. me to Seven Eleven, and I'm going to check my phone, and that's completely legal because this is a certified self-driving car. That's what this feels like. And it is a firmware update away from that. <laughs> that's what's awesome. A patch. Wait, is a voice control patch. there? Like uh, in, in terms have, of some of the commands? Yeah, so it doesn't run like a Siri or Google. They have their own voice mm-hmm. control. And there are buttons. Like It's not completely buttonless. Like on the steering wheel, they have um, these two jog dials that are scroll wheels and left and right jog dials where your thumbs would be. Um, so you can control your volume. You can depress it to activate their version of a voice control for maps and such. And, you know, like regulation says, they have to have an emergency blinker button, physical button that you press. It's nicely flush. Above by the or the rear view mirror, the hazard lights, hazard lights. But even something like un, uh, opening the car door, where in a every car that I've ridden in since I've grown up has had a lever inside the car door that mimics kind of like the lever on the outside of the car door. Here it's a button. Hmm. It's a button that you press, that and then that opens a door. Um, it 
one of the concerns I had was how does it how do they get to a thirty five thousand dollar car, right? Because to, yeah, we should actually say that the car we drove was one of these earlier models that is the premium model, right? It sells for fifty four thousand, right? Right. So like the 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 Model S is a Model X. These are eighty hundred thousand dollar cars. So did Tesla? What did they do? If they did skimp on anything to get it down to a price? Because yes, it's a smaller car. But you're still talking about a large capacity battery. You're still talking about all the electronics, all these cameras. Um, you know, it doesn't have the things like, uh, you know, it doesn't have the fancy Falcon wing doors. The I think maybe over-engineered Falcon wing doors of the, of the X. It doesn't have the fancy handle that pops out, you know, of, of the Model S. Uh, in many ways, on the exterior and, and the way you use it, it's very similar to a car. And I don't know if the removal of buttons and the removal of breakable physical parts is a cost savings measure, or if that just happened to dovetail with designing a car for the future, like Jeremy says, and that's how they save on some of that money. I wonder if, uh, is there also some other just luxury items like the seats themselves, all of that? Seats feel of... great. Seats, I mean, they're they're like, you know, your fake leather seats. I, I think as a company, I don't know if they do leather seats. It's uh, got, you know, it's got the um, all the robotics for moving the seat in every direction as well as the steering wheel and as well as the mirrors. So and here's, it, that's an interesting thing. The, it, ro- the robotics for moving the steering wheel, Yeah, that's on screen. Mm. <clears throat> is it? Or, oh no! Or you weren't oh, using you're, the, using th- you're using a thumb thing. Yeah. It's, it's so neat. that's that's a thumb thing. They have these kind of joysticks on both sides yeah. of the steering wheel. But all of those settings, and the other cars have done this. But all of those settings are stored. So that's great. If you have yeah. two, two people in your family, makes sense. Right. everything goes to its position. So uh, they're having no dash image that you look through the steering wheel, and they didn't opt for anything like a like a projected reflected image on the on the windshield. Yeah. Um, one concern I had was as you're driving you're you're looking for uh data right like speed you're looking for maps how challenging is it to glance always to the right and that screen is not far away from you you know even like i think the mini cooper has most of its all of its data in the center and dials um but how it's pre- how it presents its data i thought it was interesting you don't have a gauge for for fuel because it runs on power so it's a battery icon it really mm. is just a ba- like you know you get a percentage it doesn't indicator. just tell you how many miles you have left. You can you can configure it for miles, but the fact that like it can also show you know you have fifty five percent battery, like you would look at on a phone, that's different than looking at a, a dial that says you have F for full and E to empty. But it and makes you know sense. You have half. But the, the way you think about batteries is different too, because like anyone who has a smartphone today, smartphone knows that like a hundred percent to ninety percent on on the phone is typically more than the 10% of use time and that middle, you know, that, that middle 30% goes by p- faster because batteries train differently. Well, hopefully Tesla actually engineered their battery, you know, readout to be different than that. I mean, that's that's a problem with our phones, not a problem. Oh, it's, a, it's a problem with these type of lithium ion mm-hmm. batteries. Uh, what else? Oh, when autopilot was on. So... I guess we can describe how autopilot is turned on. You're mm-hmm. driving on the freeway. Uh, there are cameras all around the cars, um, and uh, it's using optical cameras. It's not a LiDAR system. It looks at the lines on the road, and when it can see the lines, you get an icon that pops up on the screen, like a steering wheel icon, and that says your autopilot can be enabled. So you have these two levers behind the steering wheel, uh, one for turn signal and windshield wiper, and the other side is for your drive, basically mm-hmm. drive reverse neutral. And you double tap the one, um, the drive one, and then the screen has a blue light that lights around it. And it says, now you're in autopilot mode. And when you're in autopilot mode, it's basically cruise control. So it will, adaptive cruise control, sorry, uh, which means that it will stay at a, a lock speed, your target speed, um, with awareness of cars in front of you um, to slow down. And, and we didn't experience this, but it does stop and go bumper to bumper highway you know, right. traffic. Right, which does, which does, is more impressive in a lot of ways. Does yeah. adaptive cruise control do that? Like uh, the fully auto, auto the, the full autopilot does. Uh, I mean, like do cars who don't have full autopilot that I just have adaptive cruise control? Oh, I, do I, they start not all of them. Yeah. I think they have a, a minimum of you know thirty miles an hour or something. Got it. And if they go slower on that, then you have to take yeah. you have to press yeah. the accelerator. But some right. do. So I think like the i three in right. Europe does that, but maybe uh, not here. Right, and you can configure like you know uh, you want to always maintain um, four car lengths difference or three car lengths space between your car and the car in front of you uh but even with that adaptive cruise control 
the u the user experience for changing speed changing your target miles per hour is different than most cars where you would flip the lever up and down for your cruise control speed here you're pressing a plus button and a minus button on the screen so it's like flying a spaceship you're like plus 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 to 75 miles per hour it's very much like bridge crew like you, being, yeah you're, you're being tap, at, the, yeah. at the helm yeah you are you mm. are the helm. The passenger seats, whoever's sitting in the back of the seat, should be the captain, <laughs> and just telling you, you know, helmsman to to eighty five. But sir, speed limit is sixty five miles per hour. Adap- this, turn off adaptive cruise control. Totally. This is why I was wondering about voice because it seems like that's a first of all, it's a technology that has been pretty well um, polished at this point. That would be a natural interface in a car like this. Then you wouldn't have to turn to the screen all the time. I'm not saying it eliminates the screen. It eliminates you having to glance over all the time. I mean, and, and yes, flipping the lever up and down, it's not exactly a, an analog control, but it feels more analog, you know, closer to depressing the accelerator than pressing a button on a flat screen. So here it's very digital. Everything is like it distances you from the driving experience if you want the autopilot on. Um, and then you had something interesting, Jeremy. You, you When you were driving, you tried veering intentionally um, off the the guided lines. Well, with permission. With permission. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, you tried to hit a car. No, no, no. It, I just wanted to see what it what it did. Um, and it does this fake rumble. Like b- the steering wheel is so loaded. Like force feedback in the on the steering wheel. It the steering wheel is so loaded with sensors and and control abilities for it to drive itself that it can do anything. And so when one way that they use that is when you start to go out of the road, it rumbles, and it felt one hundred percent like I was actually. Rum- driving over rumble boards or you know rumble bumbles whatever they are it was like sensitive force feedback <coughs> steering wheel video game like it was very much like san francisco rush <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a it, you can punch that car pretty pretty fast yeah and it looks damn fine the the car looks so good did how you, was the acceleration first of all did you guys did it this one have like the ludicrous speed? No, I, I think that's like a, I, I don't know if that's, that's come standard with this. But I don't think it's out yet for the three. Yeah, so, but you know, it goes from that zero to 60 very quickly. Um, it's a bigger car than I thought it would be. Yeah, it's almost as long as the S. Yeah, I think it's really? like- Really? Like, uh, I thought small. that was a big, gonna be a big savings. It was gonna be smaller. Um, It looks sportier. Yeah, mm. I mean, it, it, it I, I I like the look of it. Uh, it's just like the same height as this. So we went to a supercharger uh, south of San Francisco, and there were Model Xs and Model Ss parked next to it, so we could like do a side by side comparison. And yes, it looks the ID is different than the S, but it's not that much different in terms of its shape and and size. I think you have much a little bit lower, uh, less trunk space. Um, the passenger seat, we we all got turns to sit in the back seat. Um, it's like the S. It's there's no train down the center so it's flush um and the clear glass oh my god yeah it's like it's something you don't even notice when you're in the front seats either the front seats but if you're in the passenger seat this is a revelation the rear glass is this giant panoramic glass it, one one sheet it feels like it would be a hatchback where it's just like all window back there but it, the, it's not a hatchback and the, but the window goes over your head to this right above the front seats uh, where there's a pillar over there. So the back seat is just like you can look up and see sky. That's amazing. Through tinted yeah. glass. I yeah. mean, it's really, really beautiful. Yeah. Um, I, I'm most curious now to see the standard model, the, the one that is $35,000. Right, right. Because I don't think it's going to have as many accoutrements, and I want to. but they're going to have n- enough styling so that it's still I, Tesla. I don't think any of us were under the impression that it was actually a $35,000 car. Well, no, that's also before tax be. breaks, too. Well, no, no, but... So, yeah, it is before tax breaks, but but, but there will be a thirty five thousand. It no. just it just won't have this range. It won't have this many options. But all the stuff that you're going to want with this car, you're going to upgrade. Like you're not going to get autopilot right. at thirty five thousand. Right, that's a big fee. Yeah, autopilot's a big fee. The big battery. I think the big battery is kind of like. I feel like if it's your first electric car, it's kind of essential for just peace of mind. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, the the I've because the standard has my battery, so of course <laughs> I, I feel like, like you can do it's it. enough. <laughs> but I I have gone to Santa Cruz and back on one right. charge. You know, it's, it's enough. It's compared to every other electric car out there, and that's your only car, right? The now. Leaf, the BMW, apparently like twice anything else. Hmm. Um, three hundred miles is feels like a groundbreaking thing. So, well, so did two hundred. Um, so I, I I think that that's okay. It is mm-hmm. a what like probably like ten thousand dollar difference between the first and second battery. I don't know the exact price. Like nine or ten thousand dollars. It's, it's, it's considerable. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
But As it should be. That is probably one of the more expensive pieces of the car. And I'm living without access to the supercharger network. Once you have that, once you're in San Francisco, I mean, at any if the, the supercharger network nationwide is far and away the best charging network. Not to mention the fastest. Something that was funny to me is that, and, and you might already be in this in the in this group, is that when we were in that supercharger network and the uh, people were chatting with like, a lot of the owners because you're, you're there for 15 to you know 30 minutes. Um, getting your supercharged or if you're not getting a coffee or walking through the mall or something and people are looking at each other's cars and are chatting with each other they're talking about it's like talking about gas prices so, you know what right. I'm getting I'm getting uh, it's like 20 cents like 27 cents at home I'm big difference like like they're already the lexicon of what they're talking about in terms of the cost of energy is already like a like a different world it's like foreign language to yeah. me where I could go and say you know I'm getting uh, three dollars a gallon right and I don't know what the equivalent of that is in the in the electric car world but that's going to fast become normal so most important question norm you have a reservation i do have a reservation are you keeping it i have, after I have, I have no it? reservations about the reservation <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're um, more you sound more excited i i i, I it can't come soon enough if it was available to me in next month i would be i, I would be configuring it even if that meant that i had to uh because it makes sense, you know, for them to, to make the the more premium models or the the, mm -hmm. the higher cost models, uh, because the tax breaks there's only so many of the tax breaks, right? The the state law state tax break in California and the federal tax break, um, it's only for I believe two hundred thousand. The first two hundred thousand of a certain car model sold, uh, isn't um, it manufacture all cars? Really, I thought so. So hasn't Tesla already manufactured that many cars? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I want to get in on the tax break. If that tax break can mean that I can get the car earlier and also kind of subsidize some of the um, some of the accoutrements, then I will I will definitely jump on. When do you think you'll get your car? I don't know. I mean, I know it's I, just I, I a best guess. fingers for 2018. You think 2018 on, on my is. birthday? You think? <laughs> I think 2018 because you ordered pretty early. Well, I think uh, we both of us ordered on the same. You ordered earlier than me, but the same day that they announced yeah. it. And you know, people were talking about the like, waiting. You know, we heard also all the reports of people waiting in line outside of Tesla yeah. stores, and and and. Uh, and I'll bet not everybody wants the premium model in front of you in line. Sure. Yeah. 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 So we'll we'll wait to see. Um, there, there's not only the standard model coming later this year, but also even better models. There'll be the all-wheel drive model. Right. Uh, so there's you can spend even more than fifty four thousand if you want. I, I can't wait for the new model to come out. I'll go get a used Tesla. Which one? I don't know. Those cars are expensive. I you just look at used Teslas. I like, just think it's funny that I'm even talking about a used Tesla. Ah, uh, I know this is kind of uh, it's an exciting technology. Tesla. It's a very exciting technology. Um, That's how it's going to be. Refurb Teslas. Refurb. They're going to be refurb Teslas. Do you believe? Let's say. The fear right now I have for the Tesla is the Model 3 specifically is that um, to get to full autonomous mode, mm -hmm. what, the dream of yep. being able to never have to park your car again, to get out of a car at the mall and say uh, loiter mode and, and, and or, or Uber mode or whatever, right? And, and My dream is to never have to get my, have my kids get a driver's license. And they get into the backseat of a car yeah. and the car drives them where they need to go and they get out. Now, my we fear- are so far away from that. Right. My fear is that that is coming sooner than we think, and that the technology here in these cars are selling this year don't have that technology. There will be I, another, yet another upgrade. You mean that they'll obsolescence? You mean that they've made a mistake and they don't have enough hardware in order to right? That lidar that. is the only way you can do that. Right. And they've with, they've gone with, uh, they've gone with computer vision, and the car that I have is in this like limbo middle ground that can do can do the freeway autopilot, but it can't do the full level five city wonder. streets. I think you'd be lucky if it's just one generation. It's probably two from what you're talking about. Right, so I can live with two but generations. I think, I think the harder part is that the Th That is legal, not what they've said. I know that's not what they've said, and I know nothing about this. So, like, okay. you know, I could be way <laughs> off base. But it, it's just like if you're mapping Tesla's development to, you know, other consumer electronic, you know, uh, developments, that's pretty close to what the cycle would be before we get what we want. I know we've talked about this a lot. Oh, are you not done? Yeah. No, I was just going to say really quickly, I think the legal system is not going to catch up for a decade to what you want. So even if the technology is there, I don't think you'll be able to do what you want because you just won't be allowed. We, we talked real briefly about this um, this weekend because after we did this, I saw you and you were comparing it to your experience in the um, in the time machine. Oh, right? in oh the, yeah. In the, the DeLorean. DeLorean. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you were saying that because that was doing cloverleafs mm -hmm. on its own autonomously, mm -hmm. and you were 
more impressed with that than you were with with autopilot which you've also seen yes um i i completely disagree on this i mm -hmm. i think that clover leaves are what computers do really well um, they do patterns without dealing with obstacles and, and unknown variables extremely well. And that makes sense to me. And the robotics to make it do a cloverleaf might be more intense than a Tesla is able to do. But the intelligence is not. The intelligence to do full autopilot, I think, is as astronomically more difficult. Do you not disagree? No, I don't disagree with oh, okay. that. Okay, okay. I, I, think I, I, would, I would say, I, I would agree, but also say to not underestimate the difficulty of doing cloverleaf because while there are fewer um, categories of variables, the variables at those speeds are more volatile. Yeah, I, I mean, I would put it this way. Right now, the autopilot you're in, we're able to look at the lines on the road. Mm -hmm. And other cars it, and, and pedestrians, yeah. I, I imagine. But I think what we're talking about with that clover design, like the idea behind that is it'll be able to recognize a deer as a deer. Yeah and make a manu execute a maneuver that takes into account the other cars on the road. Yeah. I think that's a level of intelligence beyond right. where we're at now. Yes. Mm. All right. There goes our Tesla Model 3 recap at the top of the show. Uh, before we get into pop culture news, any, any presents, good present stories? Anything great things mm -hmm. that you got or gave? I got Mario Galaxy. <gasps> no. <laughs> no. What? What? No, no, no. What a disappointment. No, no that, was, that was the good one. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm enjoying um, the new Mario game. Mario Odyssey. It? Mario Odyssey. Oh, um, thank uh, goodness. Uh, thankfully. It, it isn't living up to like the great Mario games for me so far. I think oh. it was because I got to it late after the hype. But wow, I, I'm going to keep playing it. Got to ride that hype. It's all good. A lesson in riding hype. Um, my kid's a sports fan, so we've went to a lot of sports ball games, including a Warriors game that was amazing. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, not so bad. Was there fire? There was fire. That's awesome. Awesome. Hey, on Still Untitled this week, you guys talked about a lot of the great movies that have come out this season, uh, most of which I still haven't had a chance to see, but you omitted one of the bad movies that came out this season that we have yet to talk about amongst the three of us I don't think that we were all excited about, I think, for the most part, which is Bright. Right. I was excited about this. The, the, the record, let the record show on previous episodes of This Is Only a Test that I was excited about it. And then the movie came out, mm -hmm. and I... And, and, it turns out having the movie technically be all complimentary because it's built, I'm paying for it, but it's built into the Netflix account and I could have turned it on at any time. Even if it's 4K Dolby Vision, the reviews turned me away from it. Me too. Really? Yeah. You have the fancy television. You're I probably know. putting anything on that I thing. I was, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the reviews turned, I wish it was reviewed better. I wish it was a better film, I guess. Wait, have you watched it? I have not. Okay. Oh, I bet it looks good. Really? I bet it does look good. Have you watched it, Jeremy? No. What? No, the reviews are horrible. <laughs> yeah, the reviews turned me away from it. Like I totally watched it. It's yeah. not as bad as the reviews say. Okay, good. Um, all right, then maybe and, I'll put and, it on and that's partially point. because I was like, I heard all the reviews, and I'm like, this yeah. is gonna be awful. And I just watched it late at night. It's not that bad. It's it's not as bad as the reviews say. It's bad. I mean, that's that's the conundrum of this Netflix deal, right? Like the benefit is if, if a movie's good and it's built into your service. Like if any piece of content's good, whether it's uh, Daredevil or a uh, you know a new comedy special or something, if it, if it's highly anticipated, like the Jerry Seinfeld special, and it's good, and Netflix has it, that makes Netflix stock in my head rise significantly. I oh my god, amazing content they're paying so much millions of dollars for. But if it's mediocre, and I'm not saying if it's bad, if it's mediocre, then I'm like I can watch it any time. There's no real need. I, there's no hype train to ride. There's no real water cooler. I, I talk about sorry people who watch it out there. I think the mistake Netflix made, and with most Netflix stuff, Stranger Things accepted, yep. there isn't a lot of hype train. They don't do a lot of pre-show hype. Well, they let once the hype the naturally grow. Yeah, and then once the show happens, they'll put out a bunch of stuff. But it will it's usually just like a trailer, here's when it's dropping. Bright had a ton of press ahead of it. Will Smith out on all of the talk shows kind of thing. I think that was a detriment here. Yeah. Oh. Still, the fact that they promoted it like yeah. a like a big like a film. movie. Mm. Uh, still, eleven million people, according to Nielsen, watched it in the first four days. And if you abstract that to um, dollars spent in a movie theater, that's like a hundred fifty million dollars. That's a blockbuster success. You know, the, enough so that they are have already greenlit a sequel. And it, you know, yeah, 
I, good, I'm, good for them. You know what? It this movie. The problem with this movie, and I hope you guys do watch it because there's nuggets of goodness here. Ooh. Um, is that it? Just has the fingerprints of like 15, 20 different people on it. You can feel that's bad. Yeah, that's the bad part. And I think that's that's the last Jedi. No, but I think that's that's a learnable um, issue. That's a correctable issue for a sequel. Okay. I don't know when I turn on Netflix this past week, and you know I'm going to watch one thing. I watched uh, this new documentary, uh, The Toys That Made Us. Let's talk oh about the toys. Oh my the toys goodness! That made us. <laughs> Did you watch that? The toys I, yes, that made I did. Us. Okay. 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 That's all I know about the. This is one of my song. favorite things I've seen on Netflix. Yeah. The, uh, in this last year, I only watched the first one. So uh, this is a uh, I, admit, I skipped that one. An eight-part documentary series, um, paid for and produced by Netflix. So high production values, and it's always the fear you have with these genre-specific documentaries is that they, if they're especially a genre that you are passionate about, if they don't go deep enough, like okay, if this is, if they're going to spend all this money, and this is going to be the quote-unquote canonical documentary about '80s toys. If they don't nail it, you're not going to see one for a while, and they miss the mark. What a wasted opportunity. I don't think like n- all the fears are assuaged here. You said it's an eight part. I thought it was only four. So they've only released four so far. It's um, what are the Star other four Wars. toys? Oh, we'll get to them. <laughs> Star Wars, uh, and I think you should watch them in order because even though you may not be interested in a Barbie or GI Joe, uh, there are a lot of shared interviews and s- recurring characters. You know, mm. like CEOs of Mattel and mm-hmm. and product designers and and when and, you say Star Wars, it's really about Kenner. Yeah, so the Star Wars story is about Kenner, but it mm-hmm. dives into Hasbro and Mattel and how they turned down the license for Star Wars. But they have unprecedented access, at least access I had not seen in video form before, outside of the a lot of the um, making of books, of the early drawings, of the prototypes. They revisit like the spaces. They do these fun little reenactments at the beginning of every episode of like the, the business meetings that make these toys, because these are businesses. They, they approach them not just from like the fan hobby collecting perspective, but like... The, the how the sausage was made, how the plastic was ground down, and like and why they decided on that scale. Why they decided on this? That at the time everybody was doing large guys like a foot tall, you know, yeah. like Barbie and Ken. Right, right. But even they, the original GI Joes were that the, tall. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But they went small so that they could make ships, you know, because they yeah. didn't just want to make the characters; they well, wanted to give them vehicles. And then the, it was one of their uh, their CEOs that just said, held his two fingers out, his two sausage fingers out, and said they're going to be this big. And they yeah. took a ruler out and measured it, and it was at three and a half <laughs> inches. Uh, they interview some familiar characters that we, you know, people in the in the Star Wars and toy collecting industry. Um, uh, your friend, uh, the guy who runs Super Seven, Brian Flynn. He's a he's a big part of the series. He is. Yeah. Oh, I maybe. W- no, I watched. Th- oh, he's not in Star Wars. He's not in Star Wars. He's he's in uh, yeah. Masters Universe. Oh, cool. Um, Super Seven. There, uh, Steve Sansweet, big collector. He's in the Star Wars episode. Uh, so the first four episodes, uh, Star Wars, Barbie. G.I. Joe and Masters of the Universe, mm-hmm. which I think Masters of the Universe is my favorite one. Oh, I haven't watched that the, one. Is by far the, my favorite. Super one. Seven just did their their remaster of, of those. That, which is why it's, 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 it's yeah. in uh, it's in that series. Um, but you have the, these personalities of like the people who made the toys, uh, who designed the toys, who drew the toys. They talk about how they kit bashed these yeah. toys together. Yeah. They yeah. found like they went to store shelves and for their board meeting the, to launch the new product, they would like slap some silly putty on, on this toy and it would swap a head out and say, that's our action figure. I, I think you, in the G.I. Joe one, they just started putting the faces of some of the employees onto <laughs> the G.I. Joe. Yes, they did. Because they're running out of Because they of did a people. hundred of them. Uh, and and do, do you know the most elusive sought after Star Wars character? Um, the action story? figure? Oh, because you hadn't watched the episode yet. No, I didn't watch I, it. Okay, because that that is revealed, oh. and it it was never released, but it was prototyped. What is it like a Greedo? What is no, it? No, oh, can I say? Yeah, yeah, it's not it's, a big it's spoiler. A, it's a Boba Fett yeah. with a shooting rocket from. His <gasps> they all rocket. They all the rocket. rocket? With the J rocket. Uh, they never released it because it was promised. It was one of those just like the 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 box that you pre order. And um, people who pre-ordered never got it because uh, some other toy had a choking hazard. And yeah, it, that'll do it. Um, the other four toy categories that they do. Do you want? Do you guys want to know? Oh yeah, the upcoming Trans- one. Yes. Come on, tell Please me it's tra- me. metal transformers. Please right. tell me it's transformers. Transformers is yes. one. Yes. <laughs> transformers has got to be one. All right. But you don't know? No, no, no. It is okay. One. Okay. I, I can. I, you want? Do you want to guess the other three? Uh, I mean, it's a little out of the genre time period, but I wouldn't mind like a Matchbox Hot Wheels. Ah, uh, no, no Matchbox Hot Wheels. Yeah, you think Hot with Wheels. Barbie, yeah. like that, that would be in there. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's Star Trek, oh. which I thought was an interesting thing huh. because Star Trek was 
um, it was Playmates, and I, I, I like I guess if you're doing Star Wars, you might as well do Star Trek. Uh, Lego is oh. one, which I think makes yeah. total sense. But like, I feel like we've seen so many Lego documentaries, so. But it, you know, old school Lego. Maybe they come up with a slightly different take yep. on it. We and usually then, don't see much on the Lego personalities in mm, those documentaries. Mm. Uh, the fourth one is the one that's. I get why they did it. It's a little bit of a disappointment to me because I I wanted them to do something that was not U.S. centric, and Lego isn't U.S. centric. But I wanted mm, them to do like something that was Gundam or something. J- Japan, exactly, mm-hmm. like um like Voltron or something. Uh, it's Hello Kitty. Oh. So it doesn't resonate exactly with me. I'm right. sure there's going to be some interesting I'm stories I'm sure there's there. people that are really excited about that. It's um, just not the But those are four, and hopefully they'll be able to do more because I think they did a really great job with the storytelling. and um, Yeah, they, and they the brought out the personality of a lot of the people. Yeah. It was he, per- perfect nostalgia even information like mix. The people who aren't like people people, they, they made them interesting. And I, I think they did mm-hmm. a really excellent documentary mm-hmm. series. Yeah, the toys that made us. Uh, on on Netflix. God, I want that USS flag now. That like eight foot. What are you talking about? Lego? No, it's an eight foot GI Joe aircraft carrier. It was the biggest oh, thing yes. they ever <laughs> built yes. for GI Joe. And it was one of those things like <laughs> I just saw because that because they just like, had, they had the money. Oh. They were like, you, you couldn't make the tooling to make that net today. I mean, toys are expen- custom toys are expensive today. Um, but you know, I, I guess the closest you can get to toys. I'm sorry to stretch this out, but the clothes you get to those kind of toys sitting for today's kids are like Skylanders and Disney Infinity. And even those... Those went under. Went under because digital is where the kids are at. It's Well, they tried to combine them with those. And, and that's yeah. that's where they found some success. But kids are buying apps and it's zero manufacturing cost, basically. Yeah. Just And so t- having tangible toys, I, I'm afraid are things that are going to go away, at least in this, you know, in, at this scale. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks. I don't know. 3D printers. Yeah, print your own toys. Yeah, or uh, if you're into cards, baseball cards were a big thing, and trading cards were a big thing uh, in the '80s and '90s. Uh, you can print your own. Uh, did you guys ever play CCGs? Uh, you mean like Magic? Yes. Sure. Yeah, I, I customizable played, card games. I I never played Magic, but I did play Star Trek: The Next Generation for about three weeks in college. Oh, you did in college. Ah, yeah. Well, this story may uh, may resonate with you. Star Trek: Next Generation, which was, I believe. Um, CCG, who, Wizards of the Coast, I think I believe made that. They made Magic the Gathering. I'm not exactly sure if it was the same company. Uh, but it's long been n- on, uh, uh, out of public, uh, out of um, publishing, like they've uh, publication. Wait, this is that game I played? This is that game you played. Oh, my God. Um, it's now kind of open sourced. <laughs> what do you mean? O- how do you do an open source <laughs> card game? Well, because they stopped publishing expansion packs 10 years ago. In December, but some fans have kept it alive. And uh, if you go to the website uh, of the continuing committee, it's trekcc.org, uh, you can get they're releasing new cards themselves, mm. and you can download your your uh, your your whole set, print them out, put them in sleeves, and still play the game. So, <laughs> but they're free. They're free. So you download the whole set, and mm-hmm. then you just play with. Yeah, because that's how you make your deck. Level playing field. Yeah. 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 That's cool. That's a real that's a real twist on the way that the whole thing was made. I well, mean, loot box, loot packs. Exactly. The whole thing is based on loot packs and chance and basically mm-hmm. addiction. <laughs> right, right. It was one of the appeals. But there was I think that's the, the testament of the design of these games. Uh, these tabletop games. Like there was a Star Wars one, there's a Star Trek one. The way they designed them really adhered, I think, well to the mythology of the universe they're set in. Yeah. You know, you were you set out your game board was a series of planets, of systems, and then you had your own ships. You got crew, and you, there was combat. There was exploration. And it was really, um, you know, where the D&D was in the 80s. For the 90s, I feel like this was D&D of the magic, and games like that were D&D of the 90s. So it was a thing I played, and I'm glad it lives on. Yeah, I'm kind of down on him right now because my son's totally addicted to him. You to know? loot boxes? To, to magic. Oh, yeah, still? All, all he wanted for Christmas was magic cards, and he got them, and then he wanted to go buy more the day after Christmas. Do you like, want us uh, to come over and scare him off it? You know I mean? I'll, I can show him some, some of my original posts on the internet I would, from, I would, like, <laughs> the late late 90s. Is there a about my hunt, What's hunt a cautionary for, video? Yeah. I would love to see you try. <laughs> What is the red asphalt for, for magic addiction? I don't even, what, what is that? What are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, you know, the driving video when you take driving lessons, red asphalt? Oh. <laughs> right? what, is, what is the cautionary video for Magic the Gathering playing 
<laughs> the you know, reefer madness of if, manic. yes right oh yes please yeah that's a like, great idea too much mana <laughs> or not enough mana <laughs> mana addiction i don't know um is he good at the game well, yeah, but he also has bought a lot of cards. Like, that's part of it. Maybe yeah. that's what we do. We just go over and card stomp him. Like a it? bunch. <laughs> <laughs> an event so I got an interesting text from you over the holiday break for something your your kid wanted to do. It's, you're, right. you, know, you, had a, you had a parenting question. I don't know if it's a story you want to share, though. Um, n- I'm just wondering, you know, how much, it, like, when it comes to kids' uh, savings. Yes. How much power should they have over what they spend it on? You mean and, purchasing power? Yeah, and there's many th- thoughts on this, and th- there's you know the idea that the kids should be able to do whatever they want. It's their own money. They should be able to make their own mistakes if they want to. Absolutely. Um, but there was some disagreement in my household about whether or not a, an expensive like two hundred dollars uh, lightsaber wow should be something that that a ten year old should be allowed to, to buy. A big purchase. I mean, relative scale, that's like a kid buying a car. Yeah, at that age. <laughs> exactly. No, that right? Exactly. You can't like get, take out a loan to buy a lightsaber. Yeah. Um, my 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 thought was I think you don't let the kids spend that money. Yeah. It's a slippery slope. Uh, well, I mean that... compared to magic, <laughs> like that's where I'm coming at it from. So I was for the lightsaber. However, not everyone in my household was in total yeah. agreement. And you weighed in and my, my my counterpart, <laughs> my wife appreciated your input. Uh, I, um, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to no, not uh, validate your decision. I think you're the voice of reason. I mean, how did you win, Norm? Did you sh- did you show him like eight hundred dollar lightsabers, and you're like, you should save up for this? No, when I got this message from <laughs> from you, I'm like, one, I don't have kids. I'm like, Jeremy, yeah, like, I'm not, I'm not in any position. I'm like the last person to give you any type of parenting advice. This would be perfect for a bunch of dads, but the podcast yeah. doesn't exist. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and so was, I thought I approached it as more of like uh, you were asking me less as a, as a uh, about a, a, from the parental perspective, but more about the utility, the value yeah. of like, could anyone, let alone a ten year old. Get, appreciate a two hundred dollar Star Wars toy uh, for its for what that costs, yeah. and I felt a ten year old would not appreciate it for its relative value for his his, his uh, how much spending power he currently has. Well, it will be a test. We can test this theory because he has gone and purchased the lightsaber. No, yes. <laughs> wow, he's gone, gone against his he, mother's wishes and his father's friend's wishes. <laughs> the, d- the dude is gonna be he's gonna be a CEO one day because he is the most persistent person I've ever met day wow. after day he campaigned to buy this lightsaber uh, we, oh and we finally goodness. gave in I'm gonna go out here on a limb and say this kid sounds pretty cool he's into <laughs> magic <laughs> expensive <laughs> lightsabers maybe we should have him on the podcast <laughs> yeah um, well I'm glad he's spending on that and, and other not other things but yes oh good luck good luck and, I, and I'd love to check out the lightsaber <laughs> 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 Ask him if I could borrow it for a day to check it out. We'll we'll do. Um, uh, something else that popped up over the weekend uh, over this past week, uh, I think it dropped on uh, December 29th, is uh, the new season of Black Mirror, and there is actually a parenting episode in this season, Jeremy. So if this, oh. if this is what a, is that like a whole episode? A whole episode huh. uh, about the limits of te- uh, the extreme uses of technology. And I know a lot of people think that Black Mirror is a little glib. It's you know it's. What if cell phones but too much? And It can uh, be a little too social commentary for its own good. The whole show is social commentary, yeah. but I appreciate it for its Twilight Zone world building, right? Um, and uh, the first episode in this new season is called The USS Callister. And I think if you are new to Black Mirror, uh, but you're in a science fiction, this is a great place to jump in. You don't have to watch season one. You don't have to watch season one, two, or three. This is fourth season, Is it the fourth already? Well, oh the first God. two seasons were three-episode seasons in uh, UK. And then the, uh, this is the second Netflix-funded season. Okay. Um, and there are some great episodes, fantastic episodes uh, from the past couple seasons. But USS Callister, I think, sets a really great bar um, for what it does. It's a. I don't know. I don't know if I should, we should discuss it or spoil the premise. If you've seen, they, they released some trailers for these episodes. USS Callister, I will say, it is about a woman who wakes up and she's aboard a, uh, n- a very clear parody of 1966 original series Star Trek with the over-to-the-top captain and the crew and and the, the uniforms and it's, it's shot and lit like the original series and she finds herself in that world. Yeah, I don't think we need to spoil it beyond that, but I will say like what I was really impressed with is that um, there's a li- little bit of cycling between two different places uh, in this episode and the cinematography is dramatically different to yeah. emphasize that I thought artistically this was a really good um, 
uh, episode. But what, moreover, what impresses me is like there is enough here for something more oh, than yeah. a standalone episode. It feels like a pilot to a, a, a really interesting science fiction series, which I don't know will ever come because they're trying to tell this singular cautionary tale story, um, a very Twilight Zone type story. Uh, but all the acting script, the performances of the lead who plays the Captain Kirk like character. Uh, what's his name of his the, the actor? Uh, uh, someone's got he was from Breaking Brad. Um, Jesse Plemons. Oh, Jesse Plemons. He does all those advertisements now. Mm-hmm. Does he? Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, he was he was in a Fargo season two. Uh, he he's excellent in this character. The uh, mother from How I Met Your Mother isn't. Yes. Is, is yes. One of the main characters. Um, One of the McPoyle twins from It's Always Sunny. Willie, i.e. I, I, uh, William from Westworld. Yes. You uh, can go with yours. I'll go with mine. Do you find that the episodes are hit and miss? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, are, there are some that are just like really tough to watch because they're they're all dark. Hmm. Like they're these are all like. But s- that's, I guess that's how Twilight Zone. Exactly. Was. Oh, there's the, the occasional. Tw- uh, you know what you're getting into, and in that they're all kind of dystopian. Like they're not uplifting stories mm. uh, technology is sometimes from, Twilight Zone wasn't uplifting you know once in but a it while. was disturbing before yeah. it was uplifting yeah. and like the, techno- the technology here and the way it's used is meant to disturb you um, hmm. so some of it is a little hard to watch and they're powerful performances uh, Jodie Foster directed an episode which I thought was fantastic was she in it uh, no hmm. no um, and they always get like they're it's an anthology series so they're able to get some pretty good actors um, starring in commenters these. tell us what you think of this USS Callister episode uh, next up in pop culture, a lot of pop culture this week. Star Wars has crossed four billion in this franchise—a big milestone. What they pay for it? F- four billion dollars. A break they, even. Yeah, yeah. Not all of <laughs> just it write it off now. Yes. Right. Um, and then, uh, really, one finally, one last thing: uh, the T-shirt you're wearing, Kishore. We're doing some little bit of Thanos talk. Yeah. So first of all, I know it's Thanos. I'm gonna keep calling it Thanos. I don't care what people say to mm. me. Mm-hmm. It's the way I want to pronounce it. So that's how be it's you, man. Be, be you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was so excited to talk about this, not excited and devastated by it. Jim Starlin, who wrote Infinity Gauntlet, has uh, left Marvel mm. after a number of years, um, citing a a creative difference. Um, he has a, a new set of books coming out on Thanos uh, later this summer. Uh, and unfortunately, he felt like his plot was ripped off for the ongoing series. And so he got real mad and Marvel cut him loose, which is just unbelievable to me. Will you follow him? I don't know. It depends on where he goes no. and, and what character he picks up. Uh, I like Jim Jim's work a lot. I think he wrote the most iconic stuff about Thanos. And then there's an ongoing series and Thanos' birth name was revealed and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew mythology. He wasn't born <laughs> named Thanos. Garbage. And we'll leave it at that. All right, let's jump to tech news. Oh, really? Already? All right, let's do that. Perhaps the biggest piece of technology news that happened over the holiday break Mm -hmm. is um, Apple making a concession. Mm-hmm. Concession, humble Apple. Is this new new Apple for 2018? Humble Apple. I don't know. They've humble been, Pie. They've been humble before. Mm. Remember Antenna Gate. I don't. I don't. I, that was through gritted teeth. And this one also through gritted teeth. Steve Jobs, when he and Tim Cook had to sit in front of that stage and say, "We're going to give you guys cases." I, and I think Steve Jobs like literally said, it. Fine. Run. He said, "Fine, fine. we'll <sighs> give you a case." <laughs> he was just not happy with that. Oh. And I could, you could, you could get a sense of that with their most recent concession. So uh, The Verge and a bunch of news outlets uh, had reported and, and got um, admission from Apple ahead of this concession that they had been throttling power, uh, CPU speeds, clock speeds on their, um, on their SOCs after uh, the latest update, iOS 11. Based on the battery power. Yes. Uh, which so this this affected older phones because they have weaker batteries now. Uh, weaker capacities and couldn't stay at high voltages for longer. Right. So you need to have a h- higher voltage to maintain the high clock speed, but that really kills 
split these type of batteries. So instead, they would want to stretch out batteries that maybe after 500 charge cycles, you know, when you're diminished to 80% your original capacity, uh, run at lower voltage, lower clock speed. I think it's a slower performance. It's an important distinction because w I think a lot of casual readers saw this as Apple slows down older phones on purpose, but it's actually about the battery. That's an important distinction. It's not like if you have an iPhone 6, we're going to turn you down so that you upgrade. Right, and it goes fundamentally into the design of these phones. It's back to the age-old discussion of, like, why can't batteries just be user-replaced? Because then oh this wouldn't be a problem. But yes. that's not the direction that, for better or worse, phone manufacturers have, have moved in. Worse? It's, yeah. How is there a better part of that? Well, the better part in that now you... A lot of these phones are smaller because they don't have replaceable batteries, and you can use interesting battery and configurations. I, I'm going to quote. A, we're not going to go into this debate again. Well, I'll just say I'll quote a dear friend of the podcast: "Making this phone any thinner won't make me buy it any faster." Mm -hmm. That's close to what Jeremy said. <laughs> <laughs> he bought it anyway. Um, but uh, so Apple issued a press release explaining this, being transparent when they thought they previously did not need to be transparent, and it kind of blew up in their face, and explained the scenario, and they're going to do two things to address it. One mm -hmm. is that they're going to issue a software patch, which will s we don't know how, but will give more transparency into the health of your battery on your phone. Uh, but it won't speed up your phone. No, it won't speed up your phone. It'll tell you if your phones uh, should be replaced. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people had problems with the issue because when they claim anecdotally when they went to Genius Bars, for example, Apple stores, and complained about the reduced speed, they weren't told that the battery needed to be replaced. They were told to buy a new phone. Right. And that, I think, is bad mojo. Like that's, that's shady. Yeah, that's real shady. And there are class action lawsuits that are popping up because of this. So they're saying the software will help you address that, make you more aware about the health of your battery life. Uh, because batteries should be considered uh, consumable now. You're not just paying eight hundred or thousand or even twelve hundred dollars for a new phone uh, every other year, every three years. You also have to buy new batteries, which is something that we used to think about all the time with consumer electronics, but we don't really think about now because batteries are rechargeable. Um, so they've lowered the cost of replacing your battery on an iPhone six or newer uh, through the end of twenty eighteen, starting starting uh, January first. Uh, to thirty dollars from pretty, eighty dollars. That's pretty good. That is a that's steal. cheaper than what you can do in, in third market. I'm, yes, I have. I'm, I have my my um, I have six S, the old six S phone. I'm taking that in and getting that battery replaced immediately, um, and I might get it replaced again at the end of 2018. <laughs> um, and it means that like if you bought an iPhone 10 at the end of 2018, spend that thirty bucks and get a new battery. Yeah, maybe so. Right, maybe so. You get a fresh battery, fresh charge cycles. You're going to charge it more than 300 times. You charge it once a day, right? And you're going to probably not, you're going to be at 80, 90% battery health. If it's consumable, I mean, 30 bucks for a $1,000 phone, that's a that's a, a, a small price to pay. But going forward, that's going to go up to 80 bucks. So it's just something to take into consideration again. <clears throat> and personally, I would like to see a toggle in the settings menu that allows me to up it to full, you know, Full, Overclock? Perfor full performance. Uh, no, not overclock. Just use my battery. Even if it's going give, to only give me four hours a day or three hours a day. Like, leave that up to me. I want full power from the operating system. I don't want choppiness and all this degradation if I understand the consequences. Of overheating or... It's not overheating. It's just going to kill the battery. It's going to kill the battery yeah. faster. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think Apple will ever do it. That's what I want. Uh, no yeah. way. All right. No, well. no, no way. Then... Uh, if you have an iPhone and you're going to the Apple store, uh, there are some mixed reports about which of the phones um, the technicians will service and replace the batteries for. Mm. Uh, let us know your experiences. I'd love to hear them. If you have a phone you bought one year ago, the iPhone 7, and you're going in to get your battery replaced now, uh, one year later, uh, and you're facing resistance, we'd love to hear that too, because yeah, I'm, I'm curious how they can support it. Uh, I mean, it's just a whole, it's. It, we have, we'll have to consider this for cars too. Yeah. The batteries are consumables and they're expensive. We'll have to replace the batteries after, you know, five, 10 years of using these cars. Yeah. Anyway, um, more Apple news. Uh, I don't know. Is this interesting? Uh, the code for the Lisa <laughs> is going to be released. <laughs> this is interesting. I mean, it's not useful. It's not like 
it's not like anybody owned one. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so it's not even well, that. What, what, what do you think nostalgic. people will be doing with this? Um, I think that they'll be, you know, just as, well, what's cool is that they thought they'd lost it. And so they've, they've tracked it down, they've ported it over to Unix, and um, they're putting it up uh, open source. So source code for the Lisa operating system will be released for free in 2018. This is the, the computer that Apple was working mm -hmm. alongside the Macintosh. Steve Jobs was over in his pirate building making the Mac, and the home base was making Lisa. And uh, it's basically, uh, Macs took a lot of his DNA from Lisa. So it's just part of, uh, you know, I don't think there's any usefulness. Culture. It's just cool. It is cool. Oh. I mean, just to, to be able to use it. Good piece of computer history. Yeah. Yeah. Be. Um, CES is coming up next week. We are not going to CES this year. You say that with hesitancy because every time you come back from CES, you're like, why did I go to CES? Like, there's some aspect of oh, regret. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, there's regret because it's once Vegas. And, uh, and two, because it has been unexciting for a lot of years. We still used to go because a lot of the companies that we do want to chat with are there. Um, not just TV makers, but you know, VR headset makers, um, interesting peripherals, robotics makers. Uh, this year, uh, I don't believe Oculus is there, so we're, we're not really going to go. We have actually other travel plans. And you doing. bought a TV. so you and don't I, I don't even need the <laughs> TV. And I don't want to stand in front of that LG 8K 88-inch <laughs> TV. But that's the big news. Ahead of CES, we're getting these these leaks. Uh, but LG will have an 88-inch 8K TV. Like one? <clears throat> is this like a $10,000? Oh, yeah, $10,000? This is a you, unicorn. You couldn't get a 4K LG 88-inch TV for $10,000. Really? Is like a, this is like a $50,000 thing. No. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. is a what? unicorn t TV. This They're is just not doing it Yeah, this for... is purely a show of strength. It's not a, a product that... Um, that uh, that they're gonna sell that any I don't think anyone's gonna buy. Uh, LG, let me let me to be clear, it's their current their seventy seven inch TV is twenty thousand dollars. So 4K? this is four K. Oh my god! Yeah. yeah. Now we do you remember Jeez. Will and I saw an eight K sharp LCD mm -hmm. uh, years ago, and actually at um at New York Comic Con this year we saw uh there was a sharp um eight uh, K display that looked great. There's no content. Now, Japan has, uh, they've promised, they, they have some broadcasts that they're filming in 8K, and they're, uh, I think, one of the future Olympics they're hoping to film in 8K. 4K. We're just getting people buying 4K TVs. 4K TVs are finally getting uh, really affordable, under $800, you get a decent 4K TV. Um, but uh, this is just pushing the envelope. They can make the panels. Why not? Do you think that there's any justification for 8K, really? Like, small, I didn't like think there was justification than, for 4K. A maybe smaller than a, like 65 inches. I think for projectors it makes a lot of sense. Oh, smaller than 65? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. We Commercial just, applications, but greater than 65 for sure. My family just watched The Princess Bride last night in 65 inches of 4K HDR yeah. on, my, on my two year old on Sony. Apple TV. Yeah, on Apple TV. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it's I just like too. it's just absolutely gorgeous. Yes. I yes. mean, just the picture just blew my mind. I felt like I was watching film. It's like the blacks but, are black. The whites are like bright as hell. Well, Dell had a 32 inch 8K computer monitor. Yeah. So, yes, there will be a market. That's already out. People can buy that. There was a CES last year. So, an 8K 88 inch or 8K 65 inch, some, there's going to be some market for it. Uh, for vast majority of people, I think you could have said the same thing about you know 2K to 4K, and there is a big difference in 4K. And I think yeah. HDR, you're right. HDR is the big difference, the, mm -hmm. the, the luminance. And, and OLED, is world changing. Yeah. The I wish I had it. TVs haven't been where CS has been going for the past couple of years. I mean all of this aside, all this TV talk aside, is there anything that you are excited about or you feel like it, it is going to be showcased at CES this year? Car stuff. I think increasingly car stuff is going to be exciting. Um you know, your Audis are going to be there and they'll be showing uh, interesting UIs for for their next generation of um uh, electric cars. I always like the the peripherals area, the headphones. You know, putting on some really really nice multi thousand dollar headphones with really great amps. Um, it's it's high end consumer electronics. There are rumors that Google is going to have a really big presence this year, which is unusual for them. And I'm wondering if that if they're going to be doing a lot in voice this year because because of that. They seem to at the end of last year make a lot of noise with. All of the the Google Home, the Google, you know, Mini, all of those 
um, speakers coming out. I'm wondering if they're going to debut some new new technology there. Um, but that's largely just playing catch up. Yeah. Um, and then I'm wondering if there's going to be a pivot away from VR to more AR stuff, AR MR stuff. I don't think we see that at CES. I think those the companies are making those are so big that they're going to run their own events and, mm-hmm. and, and not have to share the spotlight with anyone. Yeah. Uh, a couple more things. Uh, Roku has announced the Roku Connect platform. Which is essentially what a, a stripped-down version of Alexa series, so yep. universal voice search. It apparently will connect to you know, different sound bars and stuff. So it'll be for entertainment, but it's going to stop at entertainment. It's not going to connect to everything else throughout what, your home. Is it a voice-activated box? Yeah. Oh. Um, but I think that's the... I, I think there's a limitation if it's just going to do entertainment. And uh, going back to Google, um, either of you use uh, Pixelbooks? Oh, uh, I do not because the Pixelbooks have been good. Yeah. They use them at, at my son's school. Oh, uh, Chromebooks, ed- education. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. For, uh, um, Chromebooks are perfect for education. Uh, well, there is a new OS for the Pixelbook called Fuchsia. It's one of these experimental OSs. Like, do you guys remember Andromeda from years ago? Um, this idea of building a whole new OS instead of being built on Linux, it's built on one of Google's own microkernels. I think it's called Zircon. Uh, and we don't know what it's for. It's like really mysterious still. Um, but the fact that it can be loaded on a Pixelbook opens up all sorts of questions like, is this going to eventually replace Chrome OS or replace the idea of what Android looks like on Chrome OS? Uh, I think there's a lot of potential for it. There's some leaks on what it looks like. Um, from a few months ago and it has much more of a card based interface hmm. um, where you can sort of resize all sorts of things um, which screams to me more tablet than phone mm. Interesting. so I think that could be interesting on Pixelbook but who knows they n- like Google's whole history is like we're going to experiment on this and then kill it off so I I don't know if we're going to ever see something but I think um, I think six months ago we talked about was it time for Android to get blown up and be rebuilt from the ground up. Maybe that I doubt that this is that. I bet you it's more of like an Internet of Things kind of play. But you know, interesting. Keep an eye on. You know, speaking of card based inter- interfaces, it was the the Palm Pre that really kicked those off on modern day smartphones. And I would say on iOS 11 on the iPhone 10, that's the most card like interface so far for iOS hmm. like the way it, it, they they do the multitasking and sliding from screen to screen mm-hmm. uh, I, I find it's really intuitive um, I thought this is an interesting story uh, Kotaku has uh, a video clip from um, a 2016 pitch for a Star Wars space shooter okay uh, the double damage is the development team who made this and uh, they made a rebel galaxy and they put together this video this in two weeks and pitched it to EA. It didn't get picked up, but it gives you a little bit of idea of what they were hoping for um, in, in putting together a X-Wing versus TIE Fighter-like, mo- a modern version of X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. In VR and I'm on board. Not in VR. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, make it make it so. That would be easy easy to easy to patch. Yes. And for now, you have Elite somebody, Dangerous. M- yeah, is somebody modding Elite Dangerous just to have, like, TIE Fighters flying around? They did it. They did it with... Uh, they did a little uh, VR mission for what was it? Um, Battlefront. Forget. Yeah, the original Battlefront. Yeah, uh, where you flew an X-wing, I think, or some sort of Star mm-hmm. Wars ship. Yeah, it was it was great. Yeah. I want, want more of that. Want more? I want actual combat, lots of it. Uh, and then uh, some interesting Nintendo news. I know you're enjoying S- Super Mario Odyssey, but uh, if you have a Game Boy, you could play <laughs> Super Mario <laughs> Land Two. <laughs> yeah, you need like a cartridge, like a burnable cartridge too. Yeah, in in color. How I mean that's super cool. This came out of nowhere. I don't know. I I actually never had a Game Boy. There's one. Of the, uh, did you? Yeah, I had, I had three of them. Uh, I had Game Boy, Game Boy Color. No, no. I jumped on it like the DS or what was it? Like the SP. Advance. Advance. I jumped on it Advance. Um, but yeah, the Game Boy Color was the you know the first color Game Boy, and uh, but the Super Mario Land was never colorized. This this team colorized their own freaking Game Boy ROM. No. And now it runs, and it looks great. I mean, the colors that they chose could have come straight out oh, of... Oh, that does look good. Yeah, straight out of Nintendo. They did an excellent job. Hey, you guys would be proud of me. Uh, I finally bought my first Nintendo product 
ever. You bought a Switch? Wait, over time. Christmas, we got a, an original Wii. What? <laughs> My kid <laughs> went over for a play date to some kid's house, yeah. and they were playing Wii Sports, and he's like, I love this. I'm like, yeah, I'll get you a Wii. Dude, I would have given you a Wii. <laughs> I literally, I have one in my wicker box. He is so the excited. The wicker box of sad, discarded <laughs> technology. He is so excited about the Wii, and he he plays it every day. That's and great. He's thrilled How about, about that? the Wii. What, what's he playing? Uh, he, he's mostly playing just Wii sports, but we yeah. have like it, and <laughs> like everyone like else, sports yeah. resort and everything else. But I think it's hilarious that he's like eight years behind the curve on video games. I'll try to keep him there. Oh, that's great. It's so much more affordable. <laughs> I love that it still has the magic. Because the Wii was Wii at, was good. At 480i. I, I have a component adapter going oh, into my TV. fancy 480p. <laughs> Very nice. Um, and uh, one last thing that uh, in technology that borders onto our next segment. Uh, did either of you watch or see the, the Falcon Heavy? Falcon Heavy is one of the most exciting science stories of 2018. And uh, SpaceX keeps teasing, like they put out trailers. I don't know why you put out trailers for rocket launches, but SpaceX is doing it. And we see it on a pad in Florida. It looks good. Wait, that's real? That's not CG? That is not CG. <laughs> that is it there. Man. I mean, that's not the, uh, like, the, it, they still have a long way to go before the, the launch. But we're, like, that is the actual rocket there. It will be the most powerful rocket ever launched from this planet. Is that going to get us to Mars? The idea is that it's going to be, uh, yes. I mean, it, it's not the rocket to get us to Mars. There's stages, but this is one of the crucial steps. And right before Christmas, they did their own launch in Southern California. Oh, yeah. That generated a little bit of interesting nighttime viewing for the yeah. audience down there. From Vandenberg. Yeah. It, it, did it, you see videos of this? Yeah, I did. But I think there was also in that same week. There were there was the government declassified like U.S. UFO footage. Oh, conspiracy theorists. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, unrelated. They, unrelated. They were there already, but then a lot of people thought like disassociated like UFOs were in the in the air. So people thought people who saw this without knowing that it was a Falcon launch thought it was a UFO. Yeah, I think that's not you know a lot of people like on Twitter just made fun of of people thinking it was a UFO. Like, I don't think everyday people keep track of. Of uh, rocket launches, <laughs> and, and they, like they used to, in and like, like if in the sixties, like a weird object like that in the sky, which looks like a jelly, a giant jellyfish in the yeah. sky. In Thailand, I would think it was looks UFO so cool. too. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, also, SpaceX launching something right now with a mysterious payload because it's for the government and it's classified. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So, well, there's a lot of of uh, SpaceX related. Fun stuff going on. All right. Uh, before we move into our next segment, I want to thank the sponsor of this week's episode, and that support comes from Squarespace. If you're ready to start your new business, why wait uh, too long before you set your plans in action? The future is coming, so make it brighter with Squarespace with beautiful templates created by world-class designers. Squarespace makes it easy to turn your idea into a new and unique website. You can showcase your work, blog, publish content, sell products and services of all kinds in just a few clicks. Everything is customizable and it works for mobile perfectly as well as your desktop, of course. And you can use Squarespace analytics to help you grow in real time. Nothing to ever install patch or upgrade ever and though if you have a question you can always call their uh reach get in touch with their 27 award-winning 24 7 customer support and they're there to help a dream is just a great idea that doesn't have a website yet so make it a reality with squarespace head over to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch use the offer code test to save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain that's squarespace.com offer code test and the other sponsor of this week's episode support comes from the podcast the art of charm it's an itunes top 50 podcast that's packed with wisdom and the true sense of the world from how to become more productive and professional to how to read body language network and negotiate the show basically covers anything that will help you become a high performer at home and at work and uh you uh can go to the art of charm.com slash podcast or search the art of charm on itunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and start taking your life to the next level um and thank them for supporting this week's episode now 
it's time for a moment of science. So for the listeners of this show, almost after every podcast, we go out and get some food somewhere. And Jeremy, how about we go over to Rainbow Grocery? It's a local grocery store mm-hmm. that's around here. It's it's sort of renowned for being organic, having a lot of um, you know specialized local products. And the hottest product at Rainbow Grocery right now mm. is water called Live Water. Whoa. Is this for real? Because these guys usually know what they're doing. Yeah, this is for sadly for real. Uh, Live Water is a start like a. It, it's almost like a tech startup. It's a a company that sources water from this particular spring, totally unfiltered, mm. delivered right to your door. It has unique probiotics in it that only exist from this spring. It has an expiration date on the water, <laughs> so you know you have to drink it before this, before it loses its energetic potential. Are you interested in going to Rainbow Grocery? I'm just not, Kishore. You w- should poison their supply with some antibacterial pills. I think it's already kind of poisoned with other bacteria culture. So what? Uh, what? What is the cost of a bottle of live water? Uh, I believe it's pretty expensive. Um, I don't recall. I I actually like this. So this is made the rounds because of New York Times story that highlighted this movement of unfiltered water selling at a premium. It's usually like double what bottled water already runs, which is already kind of a scam because bottled water is often municipal water that's just sort of treated and filtered. Um, Tap water in almost every location, uh, particularly here in the U.S., is is 100 percent safe. Um, Our tap water is is spring water. It's great because it comes from the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir outside of Yosemite. In this case, this unfiltered stuff poses some interesting health risks, most likely Giardia, which is this protozoan. Um, can I interest you in some severe abdominal pain and distress? Mm. That's Giardia. Mm. Um, and really, there's only a couple ways to, to take care of Giardia. It's to physically filter it out or use like certain... Um, additives like chloramine or chlorine to to kill it off. Even then, chlorine's not super effective against Giardia. It's usually physical filtration right. um, that takes it out. But in any case, this raw water is sort of built on this idea that that treatment of water, that additives um, that are happening make water bad. They're adding chemicals to it. They're feeding on paranoia. And I'm so interested in meeting the people that are buying this and actually talking with them about what makes it so special? I think it's just a scarcity play. One of the investors in Live Water uh, is this VC um, entrepreneur. His name's Doug Evans. He had one other product that came out in 2017. It was called the Juicero. Mm. No. Mm. No. Think about that. Wah, wah, wah. At the end of the day, this is about money and bilking people for money. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but it exists out there. Uh, I think like any fad, it'll go away pretty quickly um, because it's expensive. But I think there's there's capitalizing on a scarcity play right now. On to more interesting stories. Yes. Yep. Because uplifting story time. We did something right in science. The U.S. did something right. All right. Off the West Coast, killer whales have been endangered and we've seen their populations decline. Uh, up near Puget Sound, uh, near Vancouver and uh, Seattle, we saw numbers go into the high dozens, like literally down to 77 killer whales spotted off the coast just last year. NOAA, which is the National Ocean uh, Administration, enacted regulations that ships can't come within 200 yards of whales, of killer whales now, because the noise from the ships, for whatever reason, we don't understand this well, once they come close to the to the whales, they seem to get stressed out and eat less. And so they basically ban this and like, we'll just take a precautionary measure and see how it works. They enacted that regulation a few years ago. The population has rebounded Great. in recent years. You can't make a 100% correlation to this one particular regulation, but it seems like there's strong evidence that this regulation made a big difference. You've just adopted the cadence of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Do you realize that? <laughs> sure. Stephen Gates? You did. So when you kick a football, it gets deflected by the Earth's gravity. <laughs> <laughs> it oh, moves over. No. <laughs> uh, That's great. We've saved the whales. We're starting to save the whales. Don't take your ship close to whales. Smart. Sugar coma? 
food coma? It's yes. real, real thing? I, I saw wow. that. Wow. <laughs> Yep. Mm. All right. Before you think it's real, here's what the actual study was. A group in New Zealand studied 49 individuals and mm. gave it was a double blind study where they gave a bunch of people sugar sweetened drinks, usually that have sucrose in it. Sucrose is metabolized in your body into fructose, which can't pass the blood brain barrier. It's different than glucose and other sugars that come usually in a more natural food supply. And sorry, I use the word natural there. Uh, but what they found was is they did cognitive tests on these people in this study and they found people that had the sugar sweetened drinks after a, a, a sort of uh, a rest period had a 200 millisecond on average lower reaction time, lower performance on cognitive tests than people that didn't have them. Indicating that this idea of a sugar coma could be real. Mm -hmm. Before we get anywhere, 49 people is not much of a study 200 milliseconds is not much of a time difference. Actually, that's a pretty big performance difference in some of these tests, but it's like in the overall, like, you know, real world view of things. It's not a big difference. Uh, but it's sort of an interesting finding that suggests that more studies should be undertaken about this. 200 milliseconds is about the difference between a uh, dial up and DSL quake connection. Yeah, I, that's life and death in video games. It's 200 milliseconds. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. That's that's my problem. It's all the Diet Coke that I've been ingesting. That's why I'm bad at video games. Uh, and then a RIP this week to Ben Barris. Ben Barris was a longtime researcher at um, Stanford who studied glial cells. Glial cells are uh, cells in your brain. They have a they're about one to one in terms of how many glial cells are versus neurons. And for a long time, people didn't think glial cells did anything. Ben was one of those early researchers that studied glial cells and showed that they had a pretty big pronounced effect in terms of regulating how synapses work. And actually a certain type of glial cell, astrocytes, actually degrading and destroying synapses. And that destruction of synaptic function might suggest uh, that glial cells have a role in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, ben was also one of the first prominent transgender scientists uh, in this country. Uh, he was also just incredibly from uh, I've met Ben a, a couple times, um, renowned for his uh, ability to to mentor students and stand up for them, especially uh, speaking um, to the role that women and minorities in science can play. Uh, ben had pancreatic cancer and he passed away pretty quickly. But as the story goes, he spent his final days when he was um, undergoing final treatment writing rec letters for his students. And that, I think, speaks to hmm. the kind of scientist Ben Barris was. He'll be missed. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. All right. Um... Do you hear about this IKEA thing? Oh, IKEA is so into <laughs> VR, yeah, that they gave their employees VR not one but two VR headsets, fourteen thousand. What yes. like cardboard or something? No, for real. Wait, like, so what? What is for real? Like it's glorified cardboard. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but they want they want their their employees to be placing objects because I think. I mean, AR is, is the big smart plate for, for Ikea. They oh, have, they have any one, furniture store. Yeah. They have one of the best launch apps on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where you can place yeah. their furniture. They didn't get 14,000 iPhones away. <laughs> they didn't. No. VR. Yeah. Then maybe they'll be at CES. Sorry. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, there's only one thing I really want to talk about in the VR minute this week, and that is the danger zone. Yeah. We're going to the danger zone. All right. So this was, this was cool. This was first. There are some really cool things about this. Big screen. We all know big screen. Free app where you can get in a movie theater with three of your friends and watch things on the big screen. They did a promotion this past week. It might. It's not still ongoing, right? No, it's only for two days. days three, 20, two 29th days, and thirtieth. Yeah. Where um, they ha they have this new theater mode, which is uh, more than four people at a time, and you can get together with a group and watch a movie uh, that they stream to you. Yeah. So you don't project your screen. You go to a, at a specific time. You show up like a real movie theater, and you dive in, and you watch th this past week. Top Gun. Top Gun 3D. 3D. So 
on the back end side, this is interesting. Uh, big screen is a P to P to system, right? Peer to peer. So when they first launched, it was four people max because you had to get the bandwidth set up. So I, I was going to host and you would join my room yeah. and I would be sending upstreaming my desktop or if you were using your desktop then to you everybody, to everyone. Yeah. So um, understandably with varying internet connections and latency, it was it's a technical challenge to get everyone synced up, not only for video at good bit rates, but also audio. And it's been how they've been running it for a while. Now they've optimized it. So they launched big rooms uh, earlier uh, in 2017, which allowed for, they say, dozens of people. Uh, and this is the next step for that. Now this is not exactly P2P, even though the rooms that they had, the theaters had, were started by users. So it wasn't like I could say, I'm in theater, you know, theater 35 watching Top Gun at 9.30 p.m. It was, I create a room. You join my room. Which like, is the lobby. The lobby. And then we all together as a party, kind of like a video game console gaming party, yeah. jump into a server where we would then watch Top Gun. And once we're there, no dropping out or, or jumping back in. You can only hear the person you're sitting next to. Yes. Or I guess the, side the of you. two people you're sitting yeah. next to. So right. if you're in there with a group, it's it's not ideal because you, you're in there with other people. You change seats. You're only sitting. Yeah, but you, can, you can't sit That's next right. to everybody. That's right. And yeah. you might be sitting next to someone who's not in your group. Now, we tried to get this working and synchronize it. And we had some technical hurdles where I was creating rooms and you were creating rooms and we were being kicked out. We finally um, got into a theater together, but then five minutes later, one, of, one us, of us dropped. And like just went into another theater, Yeah, right, magically. Yeah, or, or I dropped and uh, I had static models where it looked like you guys were still there, uh, but you guys weren't moving. Got it. And I didn't realize for like five minutes. I got so engrossed in the film, I didn't try to sync back up with Norm. Because I have to say, I've never in big screen seen a movie streamed so well. And the, so this is a 1080p movie side by side. Um, and over, over internet bit rates, Jeremy was so engrossed that I was texting him. I was like, Jeremy, start a new room. He's like, nope, movie's too good. <laughs> I'm not going to start again from the beginning. They started This in Iceman <laughs> character, I don't I want to know what happens to him. They started uh, in with that danger zone. And so I started a new room, and I got like a dozen, I got 18 people in the room, and we, we watched it together. Well, you got 18 in the lobby? Yeah. I did oh, a wow. big room. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I could, uh, th there were people who jumped in mid, like, trailers. Did anyone say, hey, it's Norm from Tested or anything like that? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I just stayed with my group, and everyone in there finished out the film. Actually, not everyone. Somebody jumped in next to me. Thank uh -huh. like, Thanks a lot. And then he was very talkative. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> he's like, all right, I just came here for some Danger Zone. Let's hear some Danger Zone. And I swear they weren't playing the song. Ten minutes later, they started playing. It. He was like, oh yeah, this is what I'm here for. <laughs> And then the song ended, and he was like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> and then he left. But you can, the interesting thing is, like, like in all the big screen experience, you can do a, a second virtual screen. You could have your desktop. Yeah. Like, no, I didn't, yeah. you didn't have to just be watching Top Gun. Yes, you're in a social room with, like, you know, dozens of, potentially dozens of other people and their avatars. But I could tell some of the people were looking at the movie. Mm -hmm. Some people were looking down to the, and, and looking at their virtual desktops and browsing Reddit or, or you know, doing other things. While the shared experience was like, oh, it's a good scene. Let's all look up. You know, the song was playing. Yeah. And, and so that was a really interesting, like, large living room, I, I felt like, as opposed to it being a large theater. It's like a really large living room, but people are still on their phones. Right. Yeah, I just I can't say enough just how good the stream was. I think mean, it was a huge success. The video quality. A huge success on their yeah. part for the partnership to get a deal with a major studio and stream this movie to um, it was uh, several showings like I, I forget there was so what they did was uh, two nights and they every half hour they started a new showing yeah so you could but stagger throughout the day right I mean it was uh, just at East nighttime? Coast, West Coast night time it was a lot of showings they tried to do it so people would have reasons to jump in rooms together for the shared social experience and I think yeah. the shared social part of it was more ambient the benefits were more ambient like we weren't engaging I wasn't like everyone weren't doing the wave or anything right it was more like oh, this is cool because there are a dozen other people here all doing the same thing, but you're really still kind of doing your own thing and, and watching the movie. We weren't popped into a chat room kinda, after and I talking like that. about it's the movie. A little throwback. And, well, and you got to understand 3D and VR in the movie theater is not like 3D in the, in the movie theater. The glass is already on. In a th that's true, <laughs> but in a theater you've got polarized lenses, so there's always going to be a little bit of ghosting. And if you tilt your head, things start to go wrong. Um, or if it's shutter, it's like, you know, the, gosh, that problem. In VR, it's like each eye is getting its independent image. It's, it's mm -hmm. a 3D movie probably that's the best way to watch a 3D movie. 
Uh, so once we and the resolution is like just enough right now, I think next in another two years when yeah. the resolution really gets a little ramp up, this I is going to be great. I did it in the Windows Media pl um, the Mixed Reality headset, which is a little bit better, a little than bit Rift. better, yeah. and it was wonderful. Like the field of view was perfect. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could change your seat in that virtual theater. Oh, that's a, I went to the front row just to see how it felt. Yeah. And it's, wow. I it's mean, big, the right? 3D gets really compressed because right. at that distance, it's almost nothing. Yeah. And so the best seat is actually way in the back. And so I like sitting way in the back and, you know, having the virtual, the avatars of other people kind of doing their thing. Yeah. Made it feel less isolate, like less isolating. Oh, totally. Yeah. And so I would ha be happy to, if they were to do this with movies or even Twitch streams or other type of live streams, like jump into a regular viewing session to you know watch a basketball game or watch something, and I don't know about paying a, a subscription um, or or doing this for new movies because it's not, I mean the 3D is good but it's not going to be a replacement to going to a movie theater, uh, but it's convenient. I want to be able to whitelist who I can hear. I want to blacklist everyone and then whitelist my friends and hear all of them. Right. Are right. they going to do it again? Do they see it as a success? I think that this is part of their business plan. And they, I mean, they have one studio partner and, and they play trailers. They, they were trailers before the movie. So they're making money there somehow. There was um, an interview with uh, the CEO. I forget his name. Is Sean? Um, yeah. And I think he said he wanted, they wanted to do a movie very frequently. Yeah. If maybe not every week, but often. Right. I think it still needs to, there are some technical issues that they need to, to, to fix, but having done this first time, I think people are going to um, latch on, to, or they're going to figure out some of the bugs. I feel like there needs to be something to do after the movie. Like there needs to be yeah. a th something to, if it's a new movie or if it's like a, a TV show or something, like panel discussion with something like <laughs> hang out in the lobby, like throw everyone in a rec room style thing and, and let people talk about it. Like, you know, that's, I don't know how else you're going to build community. I also wouldn't mind being able to walk around. Like I, I feel like that's a constraint right now with big screen is mm -hmm. that I actually want to move around and feel like I'm in that space. I, I, I had, a, I was on my couch. I had the laptop next to me, windows mixed reality. So I didn't need cameras or anything. And I had a big, uh, uh, double gulp or big gulp from yeah. 7-Eleven and was drinking my diet cherry coke and it felt and I had a bag of popcorn it was did you watch the whole film I watched the whole film yeah yeah I forgot how bad that film is it's great it's also it's great. So great it's also <laughs> great but it's also really <laughs> bad uh, there is a chat functionality so you could be chatting like it's, it's a scenario where I wanted to have a keyboard because I wanted to type yeah while watching the movie and like have have the chat room functionality even if it's not like the vo voice chat I wanted the text chat um this is probably going to support Oculus Go. This be perfect for Oculus Go. This is Go. perfect for that type of mobile headset. Yeah. Then you can you sit on your positional. sit yeah. on your couch and do this. Gosh, it's great. Yeah, I can't wait for Oculus Go because there's so many questions I have about that. Mm -hmm. How how will the App Store work? You know, is it it must strictly be the Oculus Store? Can you sideload apps? I want to know. Can you sideload media? Period. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, so many questions. Lots of things to look forward to in 2018. I think that does it for us for this week's episode. Uh, do you want to do one last segment? Sure. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? Did you guys know Harmonix made a board game? No. What? Well, I got it for my family for for Christmas, and we have been enjoying it. We've been testing it and enjoying it. It's called Drop Mix, and it's got a Magic the Gathering component where you can buy more card packs, but it's super cool. You you <clears throat> Bluetooth connect it to a uh, to I might have to be an iOS device, but it you know an iPhone or an iPad, and you just put that on the side of it. And then you've got these five slots in front of you with all LEDs under each slot. And you have all these cards that it comes with. And every card corresponds to a vocal, bass, lead, um, or drum track of a, of a particular song. And you throw a card down, and it starts to play that. You can throw any other card down, and it will sync them up both tempo and key. So you're, making, you're mixing instrumentals you're mixing, with cards. Yeah, yeah, or also vocals. So you can mix like, you know, Call Me Maybe with like Scenario from A Tribe Called Quest and it, it all blends. 
Hmm. And then you can adjust the tempo or you can throw down like these rainbow cards and that will adjust the tempo automatically. Or you can hit the drop mix button and that will, it does this amazing thing where like it on in time, it will adjust tempo and key, but it will use the, the tracks that are currently playing to do it. And in a way that it like loops and da, 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 da. it's really cool to actually brought this in. How does it actually function as a game, though? Is there like yeah, some competitive no, you, aspect? You get the impression that like they made this cool thing and then s- s- figured out how to make a game out of it. Uh, the game, um, there's two modes. There's versus and there's like co-op party mode, um, where you are given a certain amount of time to play a particular card, and you have to play the card that's shown. Like there's different uh, qualities that the cards have of intensity, as well as what type of instrument it is. So you have to play the right kind of card in the right slot, or if it tells you to remove one, remove that, or hit the drop mix button. It's it's basically like who can play the best card on time, and if you don't, you lose points, mm. and then you try to beat your high school. It's like you're being a DJ, teaching your kids to be a DJ. Dude, I am dead serious. You could DJ a party, given if, every, if people liked this type of music, which right. is largely electronic, pop, some hip hop. If people like this kind of music, then uh, you could totally DJ a party with one of these. In fact, you could l- put it out and let anybody th- come in and throw a card down to change up the song. It's like 40-ish songs. I mean, it's like your standard harmonics. They have a license of songs. Uh, so what are the expansion packs? Are those instrumentals or new songs? Um, I think I think that there are more songs. Ah, um, okay. the, every song that comes with the game has two cards for that song. So I don't know if the expansion's fill out that song like you only get the vocals and the lead guitar you don't get the drums for a particular song um maybe you can fill out those songs i'm not sure ah love to try it out it's super, it's very cool you can buy it uh it's like 70 bucks you can buy it, buy it online or, yep. or or toy stores hasbro makes it very cool um got just new tv new That's tv new you're TV. watching a lot of tv um i um put together uh, a band i snapped together x-wing with my son nice that was a lot of fun and uh, for viewers, you can see the top half of a Galaxy Quest cosplay that I'm working on. So I sewed together some pants for this. I bought the top just off of eBay. And then I'm going to do some accoutrements for it because I have a Galaxy Quest screening that I'm doing at the Alamo Draft House when we're talking about the science of it in a few weeks. So trying to finish up a Galaxy Quest cosplay All in right. time and trying to really just build up the courage to do like the full Alan Rickman like prosthetic the one with the hair sticking out battle damage oh yeah 100 percent with battle damage i grab that hammer i shall avenge you <laughs> all right that does it for this week uh happy new year again everyone we'll be back next week i think i might not be around i might be traveling oh my is uh, it next week that starts yeah all right yeah well, oh so then if if you guys have suggestions of who you'd like to see here with me and jeremy let us know yeah soon yeah soon is <laughs> soon is helpful <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got an outro this week? Yes, from Fuggin. Hi there, I didn't see you. Pass it. I want to do it with a pig now. Do you know pig? Pass it. You say some weird stuff on this podcast. Uh, I don't know. I think it's out of context. What? That sounded in context. Thank <laughs> you.